let me unmute myself. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Beth Keen, CEO of Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's discussion of Syndrome K, the second film in this year's Ty Holtz Holocaust Remembrance film series, focusing on Italy and the Holocaust. Although we are disappointed that we cannot gather in the museum to, visit, to view the film and have this discussion, we are grateful that we can still learn about the Holocaust through film and come together in this virtual format. We are especially pleased that we have so many people joining us from places far from Los Angeles who would normally not be able to physically travel to the museum. I want to thank Tom Tyholtz for bringing the idea for a film series to the museum several years ago and for his enthusiasm and commitment in curating this year's film series. Thank you also to the Consulate General of Italy and the Italian Cultural Institute of Los Angeles for partnering with us and promoting the film series. I also want to thank the generous donors who have supported the Tyholtz Holocaust Film Remembrance film series over the years. The David Hooker Fund, YNS Nazarian Family Foundation, Rita and Leo Greenland Family Foundation, and the Richenthal Foundation. Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust brings you programs like today's film and discussion at no charge. If you are enjoying our programs, we ask that you consider supporting our work by making a donation to the museum at lamoth.org. Joining us to discuss the film today are Stephen Edwards and Dr. Amadeo Osti who is joining us actually from Rome and it's 2 a.m. there right now. Um, Stephen Edwards is the producer, director, and writer of Syndrome K. Edwards also directed and produced the award-winning documentary Requiem for My Mother. Edwards is one of Hollywood's most prolific film and television composers with a 20-year career scoring movies and TV shows. He is also an accomplished pianist who can be heard on Hollywood's top soundtracks and his orchestral and choral compositions have been performed at Carnegie Hall and the Vatican. He is a citizen of both the United States and Italy. Dr. Amadeo Osti is a historian currently working at the Foundation of the Holocaust Museum in Rome and the University of Padua. He previously taught at the University of Rome and worked for the German Historical Institute of Rome. He is the author of many publications on the Holocaust in Italy, including the book, Cain in Rome, the Roman Accomplices of the Holocaust. His recent article, Italian, German, and Jews on the collaboration between the German and fascist police in Italy in 1943 to 1945 will be published in Yad Vashem's search and research series. Moderating the discussion will be Tom Tyholtz. Tom is an award-winning journalist and best-selling author who writes about culture for Forbes.com. Tom, Thank you for everything you've done for making this film series possible and for serving as our moderator today. And with that, I would like to hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, you know, a, the idea of having a film series about the Holocaust, um, it seems that, that there's no better place to do that than in Los Angeles, which is the world capital of filmmaking. And uh, if you're gonna have such a film series, there's no better place to have it hosted at than by the Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust, which is a great institution. And so I second everything or third or fourth that Beth said. And if you uh, wanna support uh, the museum and, or, and support um, specifically this film uh, series, which we do, which we're doing now for the fourth year in a row, um, we do it every summer for one month, uh, every Thursday, um, uh, please do so. And um, our, we always include every season, uh, every year we include one documentary uh, among the films. And this year's um, documentary, Syndrome K, is very interesting about the Jews of Rome. And I wanna particularly th give a shout out to uh, Neil Friedman, Menemsha Films, and High Flicks, his streaming service, who so generously told us about the movie and uh, made it available for us, and connected me with the film's uh, a one-man band, Stephen Edwards, um, and 
uh, through the museum, we've uh, contacted um, Amadeo Osti. Um, I'm going to begin our conversation today first by turning to Stephen and asking you, um, how did you come across this story? How, how, did it, how did it make it onto your radar? Well, it's an amazing story. I was literally uh, working on a, some music project and I was stalling for time and procrastinating and I went on Facebook and started looking at uh, uh, just looking at my friend's posts and a couple of people posted a meme about Syndrome K. And it was just a little like two sentence long thing about something that happened in Rome. And I thought it was so interesting. And my immediate response was, I want to know more about it. And not only that, but I want to see the film. I want to see a documentary. So this is in a span of a few seconds. I was on Amazon.com and Netflix and Hulu and went to all the streamers looking for this movie called Syndrome K thinking that it has to be, somebody had to have made this film. And I couldn't believe it when I couldn't find anything. I just was absolutely just floored. Uh, it's one of those aha moments in your life, you know? I mean, the big, it's a, it, was, it was a big moment. And I said, this just can't be true. And then I started digging into it further and found out that, um, you know, one of the doctors had passed away in 61, Dr. Borromeo, the elder. And then Dr. Sacerdoti, who was the Jewish doctor, um, had passed away around 2000 after they had filmed him, the Sh after Shoah Foundation had filmed the interviews in Rome. But I couldn't find a death notice on Dr. Ozzuccini, which really intrigued me. I knew he was born in 21, but there was nothing about him. There was a few, there was like one short interview and there was nothing, I couldn't find anything. And I called some friends, including my executive producer, Lynette Tariki, long story short, found out he was still alive, 98 years old, living in Rome. So I booked the next flight, flew over, hired a camera crew out of my own pocket. I said, I don't have any, I, you know, the guy's 98. I've got to do this right now. So I just dropped everything, flew to Rome, and we found, we got Dr. Ozzuccini in a room, and then we got two of those, uh, the Soninos, the survivors, in the same trip. Now, now again, you um, leaped into this. You don't have a background in Holocaust history or, or any co connection directly to the your mother's italian but right. but 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 uh, was not was in the united states her whole life right. and so it uh, you just you just were gripped by this story 100 percent. and i went you know flying literally by the seat of my pants and uh you know the more i dug the more interesting it got and well, well, um, so you know i just and then i hired um uh ariella piatelli who is a roman jew she's a um a journalist there and Ariella did um, conducted the interviews for me because I don't speak a word of Italian except for pasta and brunello. So I wasn't very useful. And so I sat across the table from Dr. Ozzuccini during the interview and I had no idea what he was saying. And he, even when he was emoting, I mean, I could sort of tell he would say Nazisti and he would say, you know, Tedeschi in Germans. And I, I, you know, I would capture a little bit of it. And one of the moments I got on my iPhone at the end, I only met him one time. Um, for some reason, he looked at me and started speaking French. I'm not really sure why but I think he learned French in school like Italians did in those days. And I just happened to speak really good high school French. <laughs> so I started conversing with him in French, wow. which was, you know, if I had known that, I would have practiced, you know, four hours a day for 10 days and brushed up on the vocab and really, you know, in, and been able to ask him, I would have interviewed him in French probably. Wow. So that, anyway, well, it didn't happen. Yeah, well, that's amazing. Now, Professore, uh, uh, you are an expert on the uh, persecution of, of Roman Jews during this period, and I wanted you to give us a little context to tell us what was the situation of the Jews of Rome uh, in the period, particularly uh, 1938 to 1943, before the Germans arrived, but um, when already the fascists had been in power in Italy. Well, the situation of the Jews in uh, Rome was extremely hard as the Jews in, in Italy from 1938, because in 1938, the um, fascist government issued the anti-Jewish laws. So it was uh, a very difficult situation because uh, the Jews were more or less um, shopkeepers and uh, the, 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 the fascist government uh, take away the license to, to sell. So many, many Jews were without any any job anymore. 
the situation was uh, during the war, uh, but during the war, the situation, the war 1940-1943, the situation was a, little, was a little bit better than in other part of Europe, a lot better than in other part of Europe, because the life of the Jews were safe, because uh, no Jews was killed by the fascists until, since uh, 1938 and until the arrival of the Germans. More, the Jews were not forced to wear the uh, yellow star, for example. They were not forced to live in ghettos or in special houses. So they were citizens, uh, still Italian citizens, and their life were safe. They were extremely poor, of course, and discriminated by the, the law. Uh, uh, we saw some of that last week when we watched um, the Garden of the Finzi Contini's, mm -hmm. which, which sort of showed uh, how those restrictions were happening. Um, Stephen, I wanted to ask you, uh, you came across these incredible characters. Um, uh, it's an amazing story that there was a uh, Jew living, a Jewish doctor living <laughs> under false papers in Rome, hiding that he was Jewish while he was treating and rescuing Jews. Tell us a little bit about that person. Well, Dr. Sacerdoti, um, he, um, I, it, we, we talk about a little bit in the film where he basically got, you know, he got a gig being a, you know, he wasn't allowed to treat anyone except for Jews. It's kind of like what Amadeo said. I mean, all of the Jewish, the, the, the Jewish rights were just stripped. So, um, you know, Sacerdoti was practicing at Fatih Beni Fratelli Hospital under the name Salviucci, under a false name. He was actually saving members of his own family in the hospital, unbeknownst to anybody, right under the nose of the Nazis. It's, it's, it's literally the guts this guy had. I mean, the guts that all of these guys had, because, you know, the, it, it, the I mean, we don't need, I don't need to tell anybody watching this how, how capable the Nazis were of atrocities, but the, you know, the, basically these three doctors put the entire staff of the hospital under, you know, risk of, you know, just being annihilated. What? And I always like to, I like to hearken to the example of when things got really bad in Rome, there was a, uh, you know, the, there was no food and people were hungry. And these 10 uh, Roman women raided an SS bakery and took flour and yeast just to make bread for their own families. And the SS lined them up on the Tiber on a bridge, told them to look down in the water and just machine gunned all 10 of them. So, you know, the, the reprisals were right in their face. They knew what they faced and somehow they managed to pull this roof off. Roof off. It is just astonishing. It, 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 is a, it is an amazing story. Um, but as we, we discussed in our conversation before, um, uh, you are telling us uh, the testimonies of these uh, survivors and people, yeah. and uh, it's really important to uh, put them in the context of a historian who uh, very often individual witnesses are, are speaking from their memory, which may not be 100% accurate or may be one version of what they knew to be true, whereas a historian um, sees the bigger picture. So. Uh, I go back to you, Professore, to uh, tell us a little bit about the situation uh, that the Jews experienced begin once the Germans arrived and the fascists, um, uh, Italian fascists, began to uh, cooperate with the Germans. Well, everything changed. Uh, in the, uh, September, October 1943, was, uh, when uh, the Germans arrived. In October 16, 1943, there was the biggest uh, Juden action against uh, the uh, Roman Jews. 1,022 um, uh, Roman Jews were arrested and deported by the Nazis. But what it's um, more difficult to, to, <laughs> to say and uh, to accept for the Italians that after October 16, 1943, until the liberation of Rome uh, on 4th of, of June, 1944, uh, all the 750, about 750 Jews were arrested and deported uh, to Auschwitz. And of these 750, something like uh, in, in a number between 450 and 500 were arrested and deported by Italians. 
by the fascists. Why? Because at first the German paid, there was a reward of 5,000 lire for every uh, Jew male, uh, uh, Jewish male, uh, 3,000 lire for every woman and uh, 1,500 for every child. And uh, the second, um, on the second hand, the, the fascists were, I mean, they were looking for um, a reason for the defeat of Italy during the Second World War. They were looking for a reason for the fall of the regime. And this reason was found in the Jewish plot as the Nazi after uh, October, uh, after November 1918, more or less. So uh, the, the fascists were collaborate with the Germans. And this collaboration was terrible because I, I told you uh, more than 450 uh, Italian Jews were arrested or deported by uh, other Italians. We don't know the other ones. We don't know if the right. other were uh, arrested by Germans or by Italians because no one came back to tell us their stories. Well, I, I, but this is not uh, different than what uh, happened in France uh, in the Vichy government um, or what we saw occur, uh, we know to have occurred in Budapest with the Arrow Cross. Um, it's now a crime to suggest that the same thing happened in Poland. Uh, I think Poland passed a law against that, but um, we see similar patterns happening. Um, now, I, you know, I realize we're having this conversation and there may be some people who haven't watched the film yet and don't fully understand that when we talk about Syndrome K, Syndrome K was a invented diagnosis of a contagious disease that certain doctors at a certain hospital in Rome um, said their patients had. And because it was contagious, the Nazis did not, um, did not want to touch or deport these individuals. And as a result, um, those people, a very small number, but uh, um, those people were saved. One of the interesting aspects that you, Stephen, bring out in your film is that this hospital was located sort of on an island in, a, in, a, in the Tiber River mm -hmm. in Rome, and was in some ways, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, Vatican property right. uh, more than uh, Italian property. Is that, is that what you- Both are correct, yes. It was considered an extraterritorial property outside of the walls of Vatican City. Uh, and there's, there's a couple of basilica, St. Ignatius is one. That's a, it's a Vatican property, even though it's not inside of the walls. So uh, there's a certain jurisdiction that, uh, that they had and a certain, uh, certain right that they had that the SS just didn't want to cross. So that was also a little bit of protection for them. Um, I'm not sure if Fatih Bene Fratelli anymore is considered extraterritorial. I'm not sure, maybe Amadeo knows, but. Well, uh, Amadeo, yeah. So uh, I know that you have a, have a different uh, view of how the fascists viewed uh, this uh, hospital and this island. We, we can't, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, I'm quite sure that uh, some Italians betrayed uh, the hospital because there was an attack of the Germans uh, to, the, um, to the hospital. I'm quite sure that the, the, the betrayer was an Italian. Somebody told the, to the Germans that, that there were, uh, there were uh, Jews and anti-fascists. For me, it's quite strange because there was a deal between the German um, occupation forces and the Vatican. This deal uh, signed, I think, in October 1943, an official deal, said that all the Vatican buildings were safe. So not only the um, Fate Bene Fratelli, but um, other, uh, uh, other buildings and property of the Vatican. So it's very strange that the Germans uh, tried to enter. Probably it was a personal uh, idea of some officer or maybe there was some fascists with them because the only attacks in other buildings in, in Rome of the Vatican were done by fascists in Sao Paulo and in, uh, in another building close to um, 
not to the Prime Ministerium. But the Germans never enter in a Vatican building because they knew that they could be helped after the war by the Vatican. Right. The All Vatican, right. The and Vatican, they did. And they did help. They yeah, helped the, the, many yeah. escape through Italy um, to Argentina and other places. But, but um, this brings up uh, the question of uh, the Pope, Pope Pius. And uh, um, I would say that, um, Stephen, your film sort of is kind, a little is kind towards uh, his, uh, the Pope's attitude in this instance. Uh, would that be an accurate sort of how the people that you interviewed sort of viewed the Pope? Well, it's, it's interesting. I don't know if kind is quite the word, but uh, like Ozicini said, you know, he did a little something, but he didn't do enough. Like Ozicini just brushed the guy off. Mm -hmm. And uh, what that tells me about what Ozicini did was he just took matters into his own hands. Um, and as to kind of they all did. And my feeling about Pius is it's a complicated story. It's a complicated history. Um, we have to remember that Vatican, this Vatican city state is the size of an 18 hole golf course. It's 110 acres. It's teeny tiny, teeny. The Pope has no army. There, all there was was a white line painted around the Vatican. And so, uh, you know, there was, there was a lot of speculation. There was a lot of belief that he was also worried about his own hide, not to mention the riches of Rome. So there's some of that going on too, but you know, there was, there were be, there were Jews living in the Pope, the papal castle, you know, like the Pope's Camp David. And so, I mean, what did he know and when did he know it? The, the archives are opening up this year as soon as COVID ends. So there's, there's going to be a, uh, you know, there's a mountain of archives and there might be a smoking gun somewhere there uh, about what, what uh, Pius said or what he believed. Uh, we'll see. But my, you know, and I considered that when I started making this film, I said, well, what if, you know, what if Pius comes along as, comes off as a real slime bag? I mean, I don't want to be part of that. And then I thought to myself, wouldn't, isn't it even more extraordinary what these doctors did if they did it and thumbed their nose at Pius? I mean, that's just extraordinary. Uh, but also we have to remember that Montini, Cardinal Montini, who was the secretary, one of the secretary of states, was good buddies with Borromeo, who was the head of the hospital. They went, they like knew each other in school. So Montini was, and he became Pope Paul VI after uh, Pius XII died. So you know, there's a lot going on there. It's a complicated. Yeah, uh, to, yeah and uh, I forgot to say to everyone who's watching, uh, we will take questions uh, to the best of our ability, the uh, best of our technical ability. Uh, we will take questions uh, after our conversation shortly. So uh, please uh, use the uh, Q and A um, to uh, put in your questions, and we will try. Uh, as best we can to uh, answer them. So, but uh, now I'll turn to you, Professore. Uh, tell us what your research and your understanding is of uh, Pope Pius and uh, particularly with regard to the Jews of Rome. Well, there is an um, interesting uh, document um, of the uh, Italian uh, police of the Italian secret police uh, in uh, of September uh, 1943. And this document says that the Pope, or in general, uh, the Vatican was extremely scared of the Germans. That the, for, the, for this policeman, uh, the problem was uh, the physical uh, fear of the, of the Pope. He, he was scared, he, he thought it could be um, raped, uh, raped, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, was uh, kidnapped by the, by the Nazis. And I agree with Ossicini, and <laughs> when he says he did something, but he did not enough, because in uh, October 16, 1943, he did nothing, he said nothing to stop or to help the Jews. In uh, November 1943, he, mm, the Osservatore Romano, the newspaper of the Vatican, the official newspaper of the Vatican, published a, a very short article in which uh, it's, it said, uh, opens the doors of the uh, churches and uh, 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 monastery to help people, whatever they are. It was quite clear 
it's not an order to help the Jews. Mm -hmm. It's an invitation to help the Jews. So a lot of Jews were saved and helped by the church. I think because the Pope let the priests do it. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree with you. Uh, um, That's my finding too. <laughs> uh, Stephen, tell us a little bit about, um, there is a character in your story who is a sort of firebrand, unstoppable uh, uh, resistance figure. Oh, General Lordy? Yes, T tell, tell us a little bit about him. Yeah, he was an interesting guy. He, uh, a absolute rock star uh, fighter pilot who um, basically uh, was sort of anti-fascist and ended up dying in the, uh, the massacre, uh, Ardiatina Caves massacre. Um, and there's, there's, there's very little info on this guy. I found, I think, three or four photographs anywhere. There's no film. Um, but they were saying that he was running some, you know, guns and there's a, there was a clandestine radio on the basement of the hospital. I mean, it's the, the intrigue in this story is just too good. I, I could not have sat down and written this story if you gave me a million dollars. You know what I'm saying? It's just too good. Like you, I sat in Fatty Benefit Charlie Hospital and looked out the window and you see the, the, the synagogue, the Greek synagogue of Rome, it's 200 meters away. It's directly across the Tiber. I could throw a rock and hit it from Fatih Ben Fertali. So that's why so many people came from, from uh, the Jewish ghetto, which is directly across for refuge. Um, so anyway. Well, you, you, say, you say it's an amazing story. And uh, I know that there's some Hollywood interest uh, in the story. Um, so hopefully it will become a uh, feature film. Yeah, I know you're... Will. I know, I know you're working on that. We are indeed. We uh, are indeed. Uh, uh, um, now, Amadeo, um, you know, we in America, uh, and certainly watching this film, don't uh, appreciate the, the political complexities of the situation. And I know that you, as an Italian, watching the film and as a historian, feel that the um, full political situation is not addressed. Can you tell us a little bit about what the full situation was? Well, the situation was uh, very complicated because it was a very important um, resistance against the Nazis. And uh, uh, there was a, a very strong collaboration with the Nazis. So it was quite complicated. What I... Uh, I don't agree with the, with the movie when the son of Borromeo says uh, attacks the, the resistance, the communist partisans. And he says, I don't want to talk about uh, the partisans who put a bomb in Via La Sella. And after the bomb of Via La Sella, there was a reprisal and 335 uh, Italians uh, were killed. And Borromeo says, I don't want to talk about this Coward, I think he says, yes. uh, yeah. and uh, the general picture of the resistance in the movie is uh, described only by the uh, words of Borromeo, and I, th I think this is a very problematic stuff because issue. Because I'm sorry, <sighs> have a cold. Sorry, <laughs> excuse me so much. But uh, um, as an Italian and uh, as an historian, watching this movie, I have. I had the, the, only, the only words about the resistance, about the communists, about the socialists, about the anti-fascists in general, are the words of Borromeo. Of course, we are talking about Lordi, we are talking about other resistance and other partisans are, are real heroes. But Lordi and, and the military were uh, anti-communists. This is the anti-communist um, resistance. All that part is just described by the words of Borromeo. And I think that if uh, this movie will be shown in Italy, it, it will be um, a, a big problem, a big political problem because of the, all the organization, anti-fascist organization, all the anti-fascist parties and all the uh, anti, um, former parties and organization will be offended by the words of uh, Borromeo. I mean, it's his point of view, but it's, I mean, it's quite a strong right. point of view. And, and let's, let's reaffirm 
that uh, uh, no one is saying that Syndrome K didn't happen. Absolutely. And, and, and Stephen is not saying that he's a historian. He's telling the story as the people told it to him. Right. So obviously, Borromeo's uh, opinions are Borromeo's alone. And uh, that is why it's so important and why we're so uh, uh, lucky to have you, uh, Amadeo, here in our conversation to give us sort of the bigger picture, uh, the bigger historical picture um, that we might not otherwise know just sitting here in America watching uh, this story. So and I think also the other thing I'll just throw in there is remember Sacerdoti was to talking about his past and how he got to Rome. And then he said, have you met Ozzuccini? And he goes, do you, do you know who Ozzuccini was? He was, anti, he, was an, he was a Catholic and an anti-fascist. So he also sort of framed who Ozzuccini was a little bit, um, mm -hmm. you know, because Ozzuccini was, was basically got the crap beat out of him for being anti, yeah. right? So um, again, these guys put their, put, their, put their neck on the line big time, so. <laughs> no question about it. Yeah. Uh, uh, we have a question. How many Roman Jews and Italian Jews perished uh, in the Holocaust? 8,000. 8,000. Yes, and, that, and that's what percentage of the Jewish population at the time? Uh, I don't know the percentage of the Jewish population were 42,000, 43,000 at uh -huh. the time. I'm uh -huh. not very strong in math. Uh -huh. One of my interviewees told me that 80% of the Roman Jews survived. I don't know if that's yes. numbers exactly yes. accurate, but... Plausible, yes. Um, now, I, 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 um, I do want to ask uh, um, a each of you a little bit about... Um, S Stephen, is this project for you... Um, is it done, or are you still... Is, are you gonna, you feel like you're going deeper? Again, I know you're working on a feature adaptation, but is that, do you feel like um, there's more, this is sort of the beginning of the journey for you or, or are you ready to move on to the next subject? Well, there's not gonna be a sequel called Syndrome L. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, you know, this story is a very self-contained story that, you know, that's about a few people. That's why I'm so, um, inspired to make a movie about it because I think it'll make a great a great film um but it, it but it, you know we have a version we have a cut down version of this movie a 52 minute long version that's going to television worldwide so um it's going to be seen in Europe Asia Middle East and then we're still work we're seeking a, out a deal in the United States still so we don't know what's going to happen with it here and Amadeo you have a new book coming out soon right Yes, it is a book about uh, the the collaboration between uh, the Nazi and Fasci polices in, in Italy, not only in Rome, but the article for Yad Vashem is an article, and uh, from this article it, uh, there, is, there will be a book uh, about all the cities of Rome and about the collaboration, it, which is quite depressing, I would say. Is, it, is your book include uh, Pietro Koch? Yes, we talk about Pietro Koch, but Pietro Koch was not an expert or um, he arrested some Jews, but he was an expert in anti-fascist anti and the communist uh, resistance. So he was interested in the um, partisans, not in the Jews. Okay, because he was executed right after, right after the war. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, we have a question. Uh, were any of the hospital staff arrested by the Nazis? Not that I know of. Uh, Amadeo, do you know if the Nazis or the fascists arrested any of the hospital staff? As far as I know, or no. No. Uh -huh. I'm, not, but I'm, I'm not sure. A and which of the doctors uh, uh, were recognized as righteous among the nations? Romeo. Uh, Romeo was? Romeo. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Romeo. I've got that certificate somewhere. I think it's posted uh -huh. on the website. If you want to look at it, great. Well, we'll we'll try and put that link up uh, uh, afterwards if it's not up now. I took I held the certificate in my hand and took a picture of it on my iPhone. It's pretty cool. Wow. Yeah. And so, uh, Professor, what's the 
is the current attitude of the current government uh, in Italy um, towards acknowledging the way the Italians and the fascists behaved during World War II? Are they uh, trying to, um, are, they, are they making peace with their past or are they trying to rewrite the past? No, there, there is no uh, an official or governmental uh, politics about this. The, it's the whole uh, society is as that <laughs> that doesn't want to remember what the Italian have done. We we were uh, Hitler's allied for three years, and then we were for from uh, 1943 to 1945. Some fascists uh, helped the um, Germans in arresting and deporting the Jews. And this is something that the Italians don't want to remember, in general. Uh, left wing, right wing, uh, the fascists, because they don't want to admit that fascism was a, a crime and a criminal uh, regime. The anti-fascists, because they don't want to admit that the Italians were, are not special. The Italians are exactly as the others, other people. So we have the good and we have the bad. But uh, uh, it's difficult for, um, for me, either, as Italian, to admit to see some crimes committed by some uh, other Italians. So, so, someone wrote in, uh, uh, at, and, and I guess I, uh, you'll, you'll tell me if this is true, that the chief rabbi of Rome uh, during the, this period uh, uh, converted uh, to Christianity during the Nazi occupation? That's true, Rabbi Zoli. And he actually, uh, when he was christened, he took Pacelli's name, Eugenio, the Pope, Pope Pius XII's name. So, you know, he, it was obviously a very controversial big deal. He ended up uh, getting hired and he taught at one of the pontificate universities in Rome somewhere. You probably know which one it is, Amadeo. The uh, Università Gregoriana of the Jesuits. Okay. And uh, the controversial soak still hated by the Jewish community is that some, uh, uh, some Jews don't want to tell their name, his name. Instead of Zolli, they call it Zed. <laughs> so, so that'll be the sequel. We'll go from Syndrome K to Zed. Well, just imagine if the Pope had, cre had, had converted to Judaism after the war. I mean, you know, your, yeah. your, your leader leaves, it's controversial. You know, remember, he was, right. he was harbored by a Catholic anti-fascist. Um, I have his name somewhere but he was protected. He lived in a small room because, you know, when the Germans came in, their first, the first thing they wanted to do is get rid of the rabbi. So, you know, I mean, he hid. And Amadeo, is the story of Syndrome K known in Italy? Well, there is a, a good book by Adriano Sicini, if I don't get wrong, An Island on the Tiber. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, uh, written by uh, Sicini. But uh, it's not so well known. Um, I repeat, uh, Italians don't want to remember the story of, the, of this war, of this digital war. So this hero, some of this hero were uh, forgotten by the Italian. Not only the bad, but the hero too. That's really it's true. Quite, quite strange. And I'll add to what you're just saying, Amadeo. I went to the Jewish ghetto, which is of course right across because we were filming and we, we went and walked around. We had dinner at one of those restaurants and had the fried uh, artichokes, which are amazing, which you must do if you go there. Yeah. Um, and we talked to elders that lived in the Jewish ghetto that had, you know, in their 70s and they'd never heard of Syndrome K, Morbo, Morbo di Kappa, they call it. They, they had no idea what we were talking about. So, I mean, I've talked to so many people at festivals about this and like, and they always look at me and they go, I've never heard of this. And I said, I've met one person that's heard of this in all of my dealings. It is the obscure of the obscure stories. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just what it is. It's mm -hmm. just, it's not known. And it's, it's for a lot of the reasons Amadeo said, and you know, these doctors were pretty humble guys. They didn't go around crowing about it. They just kind of did it and then lived the rest of their lives, you know? It's kind of how it is. Mm. And, and was there ever a movement to give restitution to the, to the Jews of Italy? Amadeo? Sorry? Was there ever any uh, movement to give any kind of restitution? A restitution. Um, by the Italian government, some of the Jews have some uh, income because of the Russian laws. 
some of the, some Jews have some income from Germany as uh, former um, deported. But uh, the problem was to, for example, so to, to have the houses back. Because when the Jews were in hiding, some houses were occupied by other Italians. So it was extremely difficult to have the houses. Mm -hmm. And it was extremely difficult to get the job back, for example, for doctors or the lawyers or so on. Uh, it was not a, um, a movement. It was a, every Jewish family had to fight for their right. And the Italian state didn't want to admit what they have, what they have done until the beginning of this century. And uh, uh, Stephen, is there a plaque at the at the hospital? Is the hospital still there today? Yes, and yes. Um, I, and I took a picture of Sonino uh, next to that plaque. It's I think it's from Yad Vashem. They call it a, a house of a house of something. I can't remember. I have a picture of it on my phone somewhere. Um, House of Protection or some name like that. And mm -hmm. I took a picture of, uh, of Sonino next to it. And so the plaque's still there to this day. You have to kind of look for it. You know, the hospital's an active 2020 bustling Roman hospital. Wow. And, and interestingly, Dr. Ozzuccini, who was the elder doctor who I interviewed, his daughter is a doctor there to this day. Which oh, really? Cool. Wow. Yeah, Dr. Ozzuccini. So she's still there. Wow. Yeah, pretty neat. Uh, Amadeo, uh, before we wrap this up, uh, is there anything that you want to add uh, to this story? Of a uh, center bouquet? Yes. In general, I think that there are some, a lot of stories very interesting, not only in Rome. For example, there's a fantastic story of the um, Mrs. Wittgens, who was arrested by the fascists because in Milan she organized a net, a network to help the Jews to run uh, to, to, the, to the Switzerland. And she was arrested and um, there was a trial. She was put in jail uh, for a sentence of six years. Unfortunately, the war ended. And it's an incredible story that unknown practically unknown. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's so m a lot of stories, but there are a lot of stories about these gangs of fascists who helped the, the Germans in arresting the Jews are, are extremely interesting and absolutely unknown. And, and, they're, and not very they're, uplifting. <laughs> kind of sad, actually. I tried, I tried to write a movie about these gangs, but it didn't work. Yeah. Uh, it's just... uh, but I understand there's a new, isn't there a new ho Holocaust Museum or Museum of Jewish Life in Italy? There is a, a Jewish museum in Ferrara. That, yeah. and, uh, in Ferrara, and uh, there is a um, project to build a Holocaust museum here in Rome, but this project is quite, uh, I don't know if they will implement it or, or not. We have, I think it's a matter of money. Uh -huh. <laughs> no money. Yeah. Well, I want to thank both of you for this uh, great discussion. I think we've, uh, uh, you know, shared uh, uh, given a, a, a sort of more dimension to uh, what's a great documentary. Um, and first, thank you, Stephen, for telling this story thank and you. for letting us share it uh, with everyone uh, who, who signed up to see it. And uh, thank you, uh, Amadeo, for uh, being part of this conversation. Thank you. And uh, gra mille grazie e ciao. 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 I can leave. Yes, bye. Bye. Ciao.